Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's Friday morning, and we can tell. Uh, <laughs> a little too much partying last night, perhaps. Um, welcome. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it's custom in uh, many indigenous communities in Canada, as well as around the world, to open these kinds of gatherings and conversations with a prayer and a welcoming. So I'm actually going to ask Mandy Gall, who is the deputy chief of the Waswanapi First Nations uh, in the Boreal Forest of Canada, to actually open us with a prayer uh, to you know, create the space for all of us actually being in this fantastic venue. Uh, as well as, you know, the generosity of spirit that we're all bringing to this conversation. So, thanks, Mandy. Okay. Przygoda, stand. I'm going to uh, pray in my native language and then I will translate afterwards. Okay. Nutawe jnaskum nan hejibed miyash unji sejisagad. Chugajimdun jejibed miyash imshwe ujij kababia tutnhao. Dimun jejibad stma chugon. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We give many thanks for the things that you've given to us. We ask that you watch over each and every one of these speakers as they come to share their stories and ask that each and every person participating today take something away that is of value to them. We ask, Lord, that you watch over each and every person as they travel home and bring them home safely to their loved ones. In your heavenly name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, Mandy. Mm -hmm. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, we have an intimate uh, group this morning compared to some of the other forums, uh, but I think that's fantastic. So if folks want to move in a little closer, then feel free. Uh, we will really be recruiting uh, uh, all of you as members of the audience uh, in this conversation and dialogue as the day progresses. Uh, quick introduction. I am uh, Nicole Rycroft. I'm going to be masquerading as the moderator uh, this morning. Uh, folks had a sense of, uh, were aware of my general concept of time that would raise concerns for everybody, but I will, I will be uh, responsible for trying to shepherd us through uh, an interesting conversation and having us all out the door at quarter after 11. Um, a little bit of a int quick introduction as to why I'm up here. Uh, I, I'm the executive director and, and founder of an environmental organization called Canopy. Uh, we work to protect the world's forests and we work to support the advancement of indigenous and traditional communities' rights uh, to their lands. Uh, and that work is global uh, in scope. So I'm delighted to be here to help enable uh, this conversation. A um, couple of things as putting on my kind of responsible hat as a moderator. If everybody could turn their electronic devices to silent, uh, please take it off vibrate as well so it's not distracting as it buzzes uh, on the countertop. Uh, when we get to the discussion period, uh, if folks can actually hold their question and their comments until the microphone is actually with you because we are streaming and recording this just so that everybody's questions and input is actually recorded uh, and part of, the, part of the record of this conversation. And then there are little uh, slips which we are all now very familiar with. Uh, but that are very useful uh, for the forum organizers. So please make sure that you take time at the end uh, to fill them out. Um, I'm actually personally incredibly excited that this conversation is happening uh, and, uh, and that the organizers of the forum have actually dedicated the space on the agenda uh, to actually start the conversation around indigenous rights and conservation. I think all of us in this room are very familiar with the fact that these voices uh, and stories are actually really underrepresented generally in these kinds of fora. So I think ironically enough, although all of us on the panel uh, work to support the advancement of indigenous rights, uh, even here with this panel, we actually uh, see that underrepresentation and that we actually only have one person that is really from an indigenous community. Uh, and so I think that uh, what 
we're hoping, and I know what the uh, forum organizers are, are really striving towards, is to have this be the start of a conversation and an expansion of the Skoll community to actually bring more of those voices uh, forward into this conversation. So I really welcome uh, this opportunity. Um, just very quickly ahead, we have 70 minutes of scintillating conversation. We have three very interesting and intelligent uh, speakers uh, that you'll be hearing from. And then, of course, we have the collective intelligence of everybody else in the room. So this, I'm hoping we'll have a fairly substantive conversation and dialogue. Uh, well, of course, we'll hear from the panelists to start off with who have come from quite a distance. So we have uh, Victor Lopez Yesas, uh, who is this, sorry, Victor, uh, who heads up the uh, 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 Guatemalan uh, Community Forestry Association. Uh, next to him, we have Mandy Gull, uh, who you've already met, uh, and then uh, Flaviano Bianchini, Bianchini, uh, uh, who is the founder and executive director of Source International. Um, so I'm really delighted to be sharing uh, this forum with all of you. But before we get too settled in our seats and sort of typing out sort of like, you know, last minute emails before we kick off into content, it's been a couple of days of earnest conversation, a long night of dancing. Uh, so, so that we, as the folks that are up on center stage, at least for the start of this conversation, have a bit of better sense of who's in the room, uh, we're going to get uh, a sense of who from the Skull community is here. So if you're, a, um, if you're working with a not-for-profit, with a social enterprise, I'm going to get you to stand up and howl like a howler monkey that has just found the best fruit tree in all of the rainforest. <laughs> Come on, people. Come on, I saw you dancing to Michael Franci. That's it, that's it. All right. Please stay standing so that it's obvious if someone's trying to sort of shirk their uh, <laughs> identification responsibilities. There's no shame, but you know. Um, if you are affiliated with a philanthropic institution or an investment company, please stand and wave your arms around like you're in a storm in the kind of like in a rainforest. Fantastic. Uh, if you work with a communications company, media, you're a storyteller, you're a filmmaker, please stand and speak whale like Finding Dory did in Finding Nemo. <laughs> Do you need a cue? Where are you? There we go. Perfect. Um, if you are a member of an indigenous community, please stand. Uh, and growl like a bear. <laughs> Don Donovan, I'm looking at you. <laughs> there aren't many bear in Wiswanapi territory, it would seem. Uh, and if you're an academic or somebody else within the skull community, please stand and Wiggle like a chicken. <laughs> Biodiversity in all of its fabulous forms. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's right. That's it. That's it. The session's over. Um, one of the things that really struck me when uh, Jessica, who uh, I spoke with about this panel, um, about the theme for this year's conference, the the th the. Th the concept of fault lines feels as though it, like, it really specifically speaks uh, to this topic of indigenous rights and uh, conservation. And so I think it's a, really, it's a really pertinent subject. I think that the tension that comes at fault lines is something that we see every day uh, in this work. Um, and so I wanted to start the conversation actually just with testing an observation that I have through the work of my organization. And I'm just going to very quickly flip through some eye candy. So, uh, you know, I think my finding with our work at Canopy is that it doesn't really matter. The landscapes that we work in are incredibly diverse. The biodiversity, the cultures and the communities uh, that we work with also spectacular with, you know, the, the practices, the cultures, the beliefs, the um, origin stories that they have and incredible biodiversity. And yet, 
there's an, a banal commonality to the pressures uh, that are being faced uh, by these communities. Be it, sometimes it's a logging company, sometimes it's a mining company, sometimes it's a dam, uh, but the end result is a simplification, almost an eradication of the natural biodiversity uh, of that ecosystem, and with that, a degradation and an undermining of indigenous cultures uh, who are so inextricably linked uh, to the land and that, uh, and that diversity. And so I think that contrast between this incredible diversity uh, and then the, uh, the very common driving pressure is something that I'd like us to kick off with. And Victor, I'd like to actually call on you perhaps. Uh, given that you work with 50 communities across Mesoamerica, does that sort of juxtaposition of incredible diversity and then commonality of, of pressure and experience ring true for you or, or not? <laughs> yes, uh, good morning. Yeah, uh, good all my colleagues uh, present here, it's uh, really an honor to, to be part of this. And uh, yes, as you mentioned, um, we in Central America and Mexico, um, indigenous peoples, multicultural communities, uh, peasant and fishermen and fisherwomen uh, communities, uh, we are uh, in fact protecting uh, most of the remaining forest and key ecosystem for biodiversity in the region. Um, every one of us, I think we, we know that there, there is evidence enough in uh, in place that indigenous peoples inhabit uh, more than 95% of key ecosystems and territories for biodiversity. Um, in Central America, uh, in uh, Mesoamerica, uh, we have uh, more uh, legally recognized uh, rights than in other regions. You can, you can see it. 65% uh, of the forests remaining in the region are under indigenous peoples and local communities uh, management. Formal uh, land tenure rights are in place, but in fact the, these rights uh, are not being uh, respected and realized. Uh, the fault line for me is uh, that we have a double standard going on. On one side, uh, natural protected areas are imposed by governments and uh, conservation organizations as a barrier of the aggressive expansion of uh, industrial urban-led development uh, models. But within the territories, the contrary is, is going on. Yeah? Uh, the natural protected areas are being um, decided without any consultation to indigenous peoples and are effective means to impose the same uh, development model. Yeah? Uh, overriding indigenous peoples, governance, local governance systems, uh, local knowledge and the demonstrated tradition of protecting those areas. Uh, I will briefly show you a map of uh, Central America, what we call Mesoamerica, including uh, Southern Mexico, when you, where you can see the overlap between indigenous territories, protected areas, and forests in many places of the, of the region. And you, uh, through the next example uh, about uh, Eastern Panama, you can see that the lowest deforestation rates are taking place within the indigenous territories in comparison with non-protected and uh, non-indigenous territories. In my country, in Guatemala, the reality is even more dramatic. In the last decade, 56% of deforestation has happened within the uh, national protected areas. But a total different reality happens in places like Totonicapan in the highlands or the uh, Petén in the northern fly, uh, side of the country which are the only places where government uh, has to uh, give back rights to communities to sustainably manage the, the forest. So uh, I can say that we are facing that uh, double standard going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. huh. 
I will uh, come come with a bit more uh, depth details, but I would like others to sure. to this. So maybe Flaviano, you're a scientist. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, you know Source International, how how you see uh, you know like pressures kind of placing being placed on indigenous communities in the kind of in the scope the geographical scope, which is quite broad, of your organization's work. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, as as Vito said, thank you for being here and good morning, everybody. Um, I'll take you one example of this is in Peru. This is the city of Cerro de Pasco in the Peruvian Andes. is It claims to be the highest city in the world at 4,500 meters on the sea level. That's almost 16,000 feet. Uh, and the first thing that came to my mind when we're talking about frontiers. It used to be, uh, I mean, it is an indigenous place, an indigenous area, but originally indigenous were not living there. Uh, I mean, indigenous are not stupid. They don't want to live at 4,500 meters on the sea level. It's crazy cold up there. There is no oxygen. Uh, the, the ground the, the, is not that fertile, as you can imagine, with the, the, the layer is frozen for nine months a year. So actually the boundaries have pushed them up there. So first was the agricultural boundary when the Spanish came, uh, the conquistadores 500 years ago. So they push indigenous people to go out basically from the more fertile areas and they ended up living up there. But 60 years ago, there was a new boundary that is the mining boundary. So 60 years ago, uh, a, a mining company started to build this gigantic hole in the middle of the town. Uh, that is two kilometers long, two kilometers wide, and one kilometer deep. Uh, we, and for 60 years, different companies, because the company has been sold to other companies, then other company, then nationalized, then sold to the um, cousin of the president, and then uh, sold again. And so for years, they, they extract from their mineral resources and push basically indigenous people out from there traditional territories. And that's not just because you, the old that you can see. You have to imagine that when you are talking about mine, uh, in this case, it's a quite a good ore. And what a good ore means that there is one gram of mineral per tons. So it means that every tons of rock that taken out from the ground, there are 999.999 grams of wastes. So basically, all those wastes occupy the entire territories of the indigenous communities over there. So if you have the football field, you ended up playing under the mining waste. Uh, there is basically a, a struggle between those wastes and the territory that they occupy and the land of the, of the people itself. And, uh, and then there is the problem of pollution uh, because the impact of such activity is not just the land and the, the ground in that place is the pollution that goes out for kilometers and kilometers. Uh, this water is the discharge of the water of Cerro de Pasco. Uh, it contains 180 milligrams per liter of aluminum. Say it like this, if you are not a scientist, it's pretty hard to understand. But if you drink that water, and I can assure there are people who drink that water, if you drink it two liters a day, after 45 days, you ended up drinking all this amount of aluminum. It means eight of these cans every year in your body. And then it's not a surprise that if, you, if we take blood samples of all the population, that is that what Source International does, 100% uh, of the population present levels of aluminum upon the, le upon the limit, actually six times higher than the limit. And it's not just aluminum, it's lead, it's arsenic, it's cadmium, it's chromium, it's 23 different metals inside the body of people of Cerro de Pasco. And then uh, this is another way in which they, th this used to be a lake with a, a very um, romantic name, is the Culacocha Lake. Culacocha in Quechua means the lake of the seagull. Uh, but the lake has been fulfilled with mining wastes, completely fulfilled with mining wastes. You can see the color red, it, it's for the uh, process that is called acid drainage. This water is more acid than a, than a limon. It's basically the same pH, it's pH 2. So it's, it's, it's 
basically they killed an entire ecosystem and it's not just the ecosystem and the seagulls, it's also the people who used to live off fishing from that lake, that used to rely on the water of that lake, they used to rely on the environment and the street linkage and uh, Mandy can talk more about this, the street linkage that the indigenous population had with their specific territories. Uh, in Sudris, the boundary has been pushed far and far, and then therefore, as you can see, this is the only hospital of Cerro de Pasco. It's 120 places in the hospital for 80,000 inhabitants, all sick, basically, and it's surrounded by mining waste. So, when we talk about boundary, it means that today, um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending from the point of view, mm -hmm. uh, most of the resources, natural resources that are still there are inside indigenous territories. That's exactly linked with what uh, Victor was saying, because the indigenous territories are the one that has been more protected, and at the same time, they are the one that has been pushed more far away, so the more remote areas. If you look at a map, and you will see that indigenous people live in the more remote areas, but it's not just because they want to live in a remote area, it's that's because in the last 500 years, or 600 years, or whatever, they have been pushed to live in the more remote areas. But at the same time, those remote areas are the areas where today there are more natural resources, for the same, exactly the same reason. Not because the natural resources are far away, but because the natural resources that were more close, they are finished. Exactly, I think it was a conversation that Heather Ryan was having with Mandy earlier on, uh, this week when she noted that you know when there was relocation of indigenous Americans uh, away from the coast from the prime real estate of the coast they were moved inland to what was perceived as far less desirable real estate but little did they know at the time that how resource rich it was otherwise goodness knows where they, pro they probably wouldn't have relocated them to the yeah, but now today they need that land exactly. for and so now pipelines, oil extraction, Absolutely. Mines. US, South America, Southeast Asia. I, I think sort of one of those fault lines is, is really obvious and it's around the relationship to land and Western culture has this relationship of, of, of one of dominion uh, over uh, the land oftentimes. So Mandy, perhaps uh, can you share a little bit from, um, you know, to a non-native person, the difference uh, of how you experience your traditional territories as opposed to um, the Western concept of those same lands and just the impacts that that has had on your people as well as is continuing to have. Sure. Um, so I'd like to also say good morning. <clears throat> I would also like to acknowledge the presence of my youth delegate who came from Canada yesterday in a very interesting and long experience coming to the UK for the first time. Um, traditionally, when we leave our community, we invite a youth and elder to accompany us. Uh, I had invited an elder to come, but he was not able to attend at the last minute, so I was very disappointed that he could not be here to share a part of his story as well. Um, to be a First Nations person in Canada, I actually can say that I feel very privileged. I think that our relationship as the Cree Nation, I am from the Cree Nation in Northern Quebec, Canada. Um, we are a very young nation. We are 18,000 members. Our traditional territory uh, is roughly the size of Belgium. So we have a very large land base. Um, there are 10 communities in that territory. The majority of Cree people living in these communities still live the Cree way of life. They hunt, fish, they trap, they take resources to live that Cree way of life. And I just want to explain a little bit, um, in our territory, uh, specifically the community of Waswanapi, we're 1,800 members. Our traditional trap line areas, a trap line is an area where you're, a, f a family is allocated um, a portion of land to hunt, fish, and trap. They're stewards of that land. Their role is to ensure they monitor the wildlife, that they hunt sustainably, um, monitor the resources. And now, in recent years, have a new role of having a consultation process be put on them, where they have to you know, allocate areas of the forest that will be harvested for the forestry industry. My community is impacted by forestry at 90%. The last three remaining trap lines that are left untouched by forestry are in the Broadback River Valley. And this is what I came to speak about today. So this is the Michigamish Falls. 
Um, it is some of the last intact old growth forest in our territory and in Quebec. So we have been for 15 years negotiating with the government to create a protected area. This is some of the last area that the people from the, this family, the brothers, the sons, the grandchildren, will hunt, fish, and trap the Cree way of life, truly the Cree way of life, without having to adapt their methods to trucks passing by, people coming into tree plant. The Cree way of life is cyclical. So in the spring, we have the goose hunt. In May, we go to our bush camps. We uh, harvest geese. We were very thrilled when we drove by today, Donovan saw geese, so we were like, there's geese here. <laughs> so his, his instinct came to like call out to them. <laughs> and in the summertime, uh, we go fishing, we pick berries. In the fall, we hunt moose. And in the winter, it's a little bit of a quieter time. You can hunt moose also in the winter time. So there is a cycle of life that goes through each season. And I think this is some of the uniqueness that First Nations have in Canada is the connection to the land is so strong and is so tied to our identity. You cannot be Cree without having Iwishji. Iwishji is who we are. Iwishji is Cree land. So the continued practice of forestry harvesting in our territory is slowly taking over and changing that culture itself. You know, even with, with the production of my traditional clothing, a moose hide, this is a tan moose hide that was prepared for me. Um, somebody kills a moose in the fall, that moose is stored until winter. It is stretched, it is scraped through the winter season. It is put away. In the summertime, it is taken out. It is soaked in water. It is then, um, in the summer, in, in the late summer, uh, it's it's smoked with special wood that's prepared in a in a fire, and then this this process takes the cycle of a year. And I think that when you come in and you disturb a cycle by just leaving these huge barren spaces where animals and where people were once, you know, interacting with their territory, you're just changing everything about the Cree way of life. And I think that for me, that's what I want people to understand is, yes, you can go in and cut a tree. Yes, you can go in, you can plant a tree again, but you have not recreated the forest. There's no way that man could recreate what nature developed. Thanks. Mandy, I think that... I think, I think what you just said there is incredibly powerful and it actually reminds me of something that Victor, you were talking about yesterday, which was this concept of, uh, of uh, poverty, which is often sort of, you know, like associated with indigenous communities or traditional communities uh, versus the concept of impoverished. Uh, what did you mean when you said that this, like what Mandy just spoke to there actually uh, reminds me of, of that comment that you made? Uh, yes, um, since the start of this forum uh, with the opening plenary, uh, I've been uh, listening to the, <laughs> the, the, the same discourse of uh, poverty alleviation and uh, yeah, struggle against poverty, but uh, poverty for us is, is a consequence. Uh, it's a consequence of a systematic historic a series of, of uh, facts uh, and the a current situation uh, where there are many people responsible for carrying out these decisions in businesses and in policies to impoverish people, to impoverish land, to impoverish ecosystems. Um, following on uh, what Flaviano uh, presented, uh, mm -hmm. That is the reality in many of our territories. Indigenous peoples ha has been uh, withdrawing mm -hmm. from the, uh, to the very hard and remote, uh, remotest areas of, of their territories um, under these uh, factors of impoverishment. Uh, I want to mention one single case, one what for us in Guatemala, is a, is a very representative case of uh, the Maya Kekchi indigenous peoples, which now 
in the heart of the territory where protected, national protected areas are being implanted, even there where they, are, uh, they have been rich of many resources, knowledge, traditions, <laughs> connections to land, uh, they are suffering the, the, the implanting of this protected area called uh, Semok Champay, which is one of the main, of the top tourism destinations in my country. And the, the main reason government has to implant those, uh, uh, this protected area is to bring uh, development to these communities. But in fact, uh, what is happening is that they are impoverishing these, these peoples, they are excluding them from the management of the natural park, the natural monument of Semok Champay, a very beautiful one. Um, and in the middle of the, uh, a lot of interest uh, across the Cabon River uh, of hydroelectrical uh, projects managed uh, by or, or given in concession to private companies mm -hmm. in the Maya Kekchi area. So, uh, I think we, s we, we, we should stop of only thinking of a poverty as a problem, but poverty is a consequence, and a consequence that it's been uh, strengthened and making m more grave today. Yeah. And maybe I can just flip that a little bit and, and it be less about sort of, because economic poverty is a, is a real pressing issue for many indigenous communities around the world, um, but sort of, Aside from, uh, and sometimes not related to economic poverty, there's, there's loss, obviously, associated uh, with the impacts of large-scale mining and forestry. And Mandy, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit uh, around your experience in terms of uh, the loss uh, that, uh, you know, having 90% of your territory having been impacted by forestry. What, did, what, did, what does that actually mean, and, and how has that been contrasted for mm -hmm. you? Um, I would like to share uh, an experience that I had. Our territory, like I mentioned, is divided into 63 trap lines. My trap line, my family trap line, is very south, and the Broadback River is very north. In, um, as I began to work for my community, I am the deputy chief, um, we actually, I got to encounter Don Sagnash. So Don, also known as Simon Nabel, uh, he is, the tally man of the Broadback River. His trap line is the Broadback River. Don told me when I came to the Broadback uh, with, with some NGO groups and media, we were going to share this story. He said to me, as we walked on this path, this path has been here for a thousand years. My father told me to protect this trap line. My father asked me to make sure that the trees were never cut. And I didn't really understand the importance of that until I had this experience where we were with Greenpeace and Greenpeace took us in a helicopter and they had this great idea to make this huge banner that said save the broadback and we laid it out in a in kind of like a, a swampy area so where I live forestry is the norm since I was a child my grandfather was going to these consultation meetings and you know giving permission for these cuts never getting you know it was always a give situation. He never had the opportunity to say no. It was, you can go here or you can go here. So he was always putting something on the table. When we would go into the bush, you know, passing these huge logging trucks that are fully loaded, seeing tree planters coming in in the middle of the summer, totally the norm to me. But when I went to the Broadback and we went up in that helicopter and we passed over these huge, you know, forestry blocks that had just been cut, nothing, that was the norm to me, but when I flew over the Broadback and saw this last intact forest and saw the density of how many trees there were per cubic meter and just saw how old these trees were, in that moment, I really mourned for what I knew my family had lost. That my sons would never get the opportunity to hunt in a forest like this, that my sons would have to live this adapted Cree way of life. And I mourned for what I thought that this family could potentially lose too. So to me, it was such a powerful event. It was such a moving experience. And I was so touched to have that and to share that and to really understand what Don had been fighting for. For 15 years, our community was really looking to negotiate protection. We did negotiate protection. We did obtain a small part. 
and I will share later on why I feel like there's more work to be done. But you know, I just want people here to kind of understand when I came to to the UK, everybody kind of had this perception that Canada was this endless abundance of resources and trees everywhere. And this is the amount of forestry that has impacted Quebec. We have 33,000 kilometers of forestry roads spaghettiing through just my territory. And I'm a small little dot. And so, so if people are looking at this, Mandy, it's the red that it uh, indicates forestry mm -hmm. and road impact. Mm -hmm. The red line is the commercial tree limit line, so companies are not allowed to go and harvest trees above that red line, but that red line has been moved up this year. So we were very disappointed that, you know, what we feel is such a delicate resource now and there's such a big demand on has, is actually going to undergo more pressure, which is all the more reason why we fight for this river to be protected. Um, thank you, Mandy. That's, uh incredibly powerful experience and, and I think we all have, uh, probably everybody in this room can share a, a similar experience, although not, not obviously as personal as your one. Um, I'd like to just pivot us a little bit um, uh, along perhaps a slightly different fault line. Um, you know, I think there are f fault lines, there's tension that's inherent within sort of where the plates meet. Uh, and uh, sometimes that, uh, you know, I think sort of there's a perception around conflict and tension that it, it's it's a negative experience, but uh, that tension that creates can actually be sort of the catalyst for a lot of creativity. Um, and so I'd like us to just uh, tap into a little bit more around how sometimes that tension can actually be the trigger for getting things done, for things changing. Uh, and I'd like uh, to call on each of you to sort of reflect a little bit around that because sometimes knowledge uh, isn't enough or actually having the legal right isn't enough. Sometimes there actually needs to be an imperative uh, to actually change the status quo, to change the circumstance uh, for the industry that's operating on the land base and for the government that actually uh, has been sort of giving uh, uh, the license uh, for these unsustainable practices to happen. So I know that uh, the experience that we've had at Canopy is that in a, in a landscape such as the Great Bear Rainforest, it went from 90% of the Great Bear Rainforest being open for logging. 27 First Nations communities who were absolutely ready to be engaged in decision-making power over their communities and their land uh, actually being largely excluded from that decision-making process to today where the Great Bear Rainforest, 85% of it is now currently formally protected or off limits to logging. And uh, First Nations are recognized in a government to government relationship with the provincial government. That actually happened not because of the incredible diversity. Well, it happened because of the incredible diversity and it happened because First Nations governments were ready to lead. But the catalyst for actually having recognition of both of those elements was actually customers engaging in large international customers of the forest industry, putting pressure uh, on both the government and the forest industry to come to the negotiations table, and then in the end to actually finalize that agreement. And so it wasn't really until there was a, an imperative or a catalyst for a change in the status quo uh, that that actually happened. So Flaviano, you're, you're a scientist, you have the information. Uh, how do you get that information drawn through into actually a change uh, in decisions? Well, yeah, first of all, I mean, I completely agree with you and said that we can, we have to take conflicts as an opportunity. So there's something that we say, I'm, I'm Italian actually, and there's something that we say okay. in Italy that after the Middle Age in Italy and 500 years of conquering and fighting and what happened, we have the Renaissance, while in Switzerland they had 800 years of peace and they go with cuckoo watch. Mm -hmm. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, so, is, that an, in, is that an EU joke there? <laughs> yes, sort of. <laughs> but, I mean, it's true that having this kind of conflict that you can see uh, how the... I, I have seen, and we, we now follow with Source International 29 different projects mm -hmm. in 16 different countries, and a common pattern is actually that from this kind of conflicts we, we can see nowadays a sort of renaissance of indigenous 
pride and indigenous communities how they start to protect more their environment, their traditional way of life, mm -hmm. their system. I mean, um, there is a problem here. It's, it's, it's a huge clash uh, of language, of word. It yeah. seems, I mean, we have been working in, in the Amazon forest in Peru. Uh, I was living there for four months and helping this indigenous community, Shipibo Kunibo, in getting evidences about the human rights abuses and the pollution caused by an oil company. And the data was quite astonishing. I mean, uh, those two communities has a median age of death of 27 years. That means that half of the population died before the 27 year due to the oil pollution in their groundwater and in their crops. But when we finally set up a negotiation table, uh, was uh, it seems like a movie to be on Mars or something like that. Because you imagine a table done like this, and on one side you have the indigenous community with their traditional clothes and their traditional way of thinking with the, their cosmo cos cosmovisions that says, how they are part of the land. And from the other side, you had the representative of the oil companies talking about the fact that they don't have a paper who recognize their rights on the land, talking about the fact that there is no official border between their land and what they perceive as their land. Mm -hmm. So the oil company were perceiving like, this is our land because we have a paper that says that we have the rights to extract oil in this land. And the other one would say no because you don't own the land, it's the land we own ourselves as indigenous people. So there is this enormous clash of uh, thinking, of speaking, of understanding the world. Uh, and that's somehow I would refer the work of Source International as a translator. Because we use science, we collect scientific evidences in order to translate from what the indigenous communities are thinking to what companies uh, governments, uh, tribunals understand. So that's, that's the key point somehow, how to make those two words, there is a conflict and then take the opportunity, but in order to take the opportunity from the conflict, you need that those two words talk the same language. You're the translator. It's kind of. Yeah, and, and how does uh, traditional ecological knowledge uh, fit into the work of Source International? Is that something that you know? Oftentimes, you know, Western, Western science, and then the traditional ecological knowledge of, of local communities. Sometimes there's also there's a little bit of a, a gap or a separation between those as well. Yeah, I mean, we we work on somehow on two different parallel uh, work. From one side, we have the we are trying to rise up the traditional knowledge into the mainstream. Uh, from the other side, we are also very realistic and we know that if we have to go to the tribunal, we need also to have the Western conception of science or, or data, at least. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you want to sue a mining company, you cannot sue the mining company arguing that the water is part of the streams of the world and the people need, uh, belong to the water. You know, it's much easier and much effective to to the mining company because the water is polluted and we have data that the water is polluted. So you have this kind of two different things one to, do, to, to rise up both at mm -hmm. the same time. Right. Victor or Mandy, do you want to offer anything here? Just following on the, uh, um, what Flaviano mentioned, I think uh, one great potential of, of action uh, as the the, the title of this forum says creating this, this common ground uh, happens through the joint actions like uh, Source and, and my organization are starting to do. Uh, this translation is not only about collective, uh, collecting uh, scientific data, but also to understand people's vision on their natural resources and to put it in, in, in the way of legal and uh, mm -hmm. legal actions uh, social pressure, visibility actions. We are lacking uh, uh, a lot of capabilities to, to be more visible to the uh, urban societies, to the cities which are receiving the water we are protecting. And the, 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 the many, many other products, food, uh, different fibers and many other products from the forest we are protecting. 
One little example in the Guatemala South Coast where the source is uh, collaborating with us um, trying to, um, to, to make all, all the scientific work uh, for the legal action we are preparing against uh, big scale uh, monocrop agriculture, mainly sugarcane and, and palm, oil palm. Uh, they are helping us to, to understand how we can uh, propose to the government and to these companies uh, what uh, is called environmental flow. Uh, in, in Spanish we say ecological flow. Uh, the minimum amount of water that rivers uh, should deliver to the, to the sea and to the coastal ecosystem like mangrove where, where communities and fishermen livelihood, livelihoods are. Uh, we, ha we are collecting scientific data, but uh, we also are collecting uh, fishermen and fisherwomen uh, uh, testimonies uh, about what's, going, uh, what's been happening uh, in the last 25 years uh, af uh, after these big farms of sugarcane and, and palm are starting to grab all the water from the river and from the, from the soil. Um, and a fisherman simply said, uh, well, wh when we make uh, social pressure and they release the river for uh, one or two days, we have water in, in the mangrove. But the water is not enough. And uh, when the water reaches and the, the fishes uh, catch in the small uh, uh, water areas and circulate around the river, uh, when the sun comes up, and the water is, is very hot, all the fish die. That testimony joined to the, to the metrics of water uh, source does are a strong element of our struggle to make these companies to release the, uh, the proper amount of water uh, to these communities, like a little example. And I, I just want to pick up on one piece that you, you, that you said there, Victor, which is just sometimes like having the vision, having the plan, having the science, uh, even having the traditional stories, them by themselves isn't enough. Then, then they then, then need to be fed into a legal strategy or a public uh, kind of agitation uh, and leverage strategy or markets campaigns. Or um, So Mandy, I, I'd like to ask you, I mean, in Canada, you actually, you have customary rights. You have legal rights uh, to your land um, and so and you've had a plan in place for 15 years and so why why is it that the Waswanapi have invited in conservation organizations like Canopy and like Greenpeace what is it that you felt that uh, or feel that you the opportunities that are created by that mm -hmm. kind of work together mm -hmm. well kind of in keeping with the theme of of skull and the fault lines I kind of feel like I live on a fault line and I've been on that fault line for 15 years. We are a nation that did win a lands claim settlement. Uh, there was a major hydroelectric project that was built in our territory. We were recognized as land users. Um, we do from that have a relationship with the government. We have the ability to negotiate directly with the Quebec government. But you know, we have to agree to the extraction of resources in our territory as part of that too. And for me, the extraction process is so intensive that it's getting to the point where the demand on this resource is so intense that people are fighting to cut these last little territories of trees. So what's the point? You know, why not leave something standing? Why not recognize something, something natural, something real? And my community, we've been working on this for 15 years, really trying to negotiate in a, a massive protected area. Two years ago, we did obtain protection of the Broadback River, two thirds of it. The northern portion of the Broadback River was covered uh, with a protected area. North of the Broadback, there had been an extensive fire. So there was a large area of burnt forest that was protected, and to us, that was of no value. The southern portion of the Broadback Forest along the river is home to an endangered species, the woodland caribou. This area had been completely left open. It represents one third of the Broadback River. We are looking and seeking and working and pushing to ensure that Quebec protects that last critical area. To us, the work is not complete until we have an area that covers the wildlife that's at risk. 
and you know, in working with groups like Canopy, um, I had the opportunity to participate in a fashion summit that they held, having this dialogue with fashion companies that were coming in and you know, talking about how they were sourcing um, pulp for viscous for the clothing that they were making. In my territory, we had a lumber mill that was recently transformed into a pulp mill. So we were very worried that we were kind of heading down this path of additional pressure on our resources. And you know, to speak to that to that component of change that Nicole touched on, you know, this file has been changing for 15 years, and I feel like it has been little wins along the way. But I'm looking for that last big change momentum. I'm looking for my my Quebec government to really follow through with what they said. Um, I was very pleased that two weeks ago they had contacted and sent us uh, a document asking us to comment on that remaining portion of the Broadback River that they wanted to have a dialogue on in protecting. So to me, you know, my presence here at Skoll is to really show that there is opportunity for change, that there is progression if you really keep at something, if you have a plan, if you're very committed and dedicated and just keep telling your story as many times as you can, eventually it will reach the right person and just snowball into something. And I really feel like the work that we've done with all of our NGOs and Canopy especially really getting us into that international forum and being here today is one of one of the steps that we're taking along that path. So I you know I'm very open. I'm open to all of the discussion that Quebec wants to have and I do feel like you know we're in that last leg of the race where hopefully we will see protection of the Broadback River Forest. I think so too. <laughs> Um, I'm going to open it up. Uh, I think you've all been very engaged and, uh, and, and quiet participants. Um, and so uh, uh, I think we're going to, Brad is going to be our mic runner. Um, but maybe just as folks gather their thoughts with questions or contributions to the conversation, um, uh, I'd like to actually uh, ask Donovan, who is 18, uh, and a uh, youth member of the West Wanapee First Nation took his first flight a day and a half ago uh, and almost got held up at immigration at Heathrow, but we're lucky to have him here. Um, Donovan, I'm wondering if you could just share what it was like for you, the, you know, like you're, you're a hunter, you're a fisher, uh, what it's like when the first time that you went out to the Broadback? Well, the Broadback is very, uh a unique place. It's very amazing. I mean, if I can compare it to my dad's land, I mean, my dad's land has been probably cut 60 to 70 percent of his land. So the Broadback River is, the forest is very like, you can barely like, go in places. And so like for an example, when when I went to Broadback with uh, Mandy and uh, what is it? the, 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 I think I should know and okay. with with NRDC mm -hmm. and uh, this guy was flying the drone like recording and his drone died and fell in the woods and it was like nowhere to be found I mean <laughs> it was like can you help me find it and I was like the guy who drove the drone almost got lost like not even far from the camp and it was like we were yelling for his name and he was there like coming up like really sweating panicking and <laughs> but like, but yeah, like the wildlife over there is very active, comparing to my dad's trap line. I mean, mm -hmm. when we go, uh, I went hunting and it's past uh, no, like two weeks ago, moose hunting. And this is an image of you, right? Yeah, this yeah, that's an yeah. image for me. Yeah, and uh, I've noticed uh, like m moose in the most like uh, south of my dad's land, uh, the the moose have like some cord some size of bugs on them and they start like uh like coming the f the, f the fur comes off and mm -hmm. like i have a picture on my phone but i don't know if i can that one my brother killed that one so i was taking out the kidneys but anyways i noticed <laughs> up north like broadback river is very uh alive and mm -hmm. like i look down and like trying looking for the drone all i see is tracks of wildlife and everything is very amazing yeah that is amazing. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Thanks. And feel free to offer. Uh, anybody else? Thanks. Yeah. 
And if you can say who you are and, and who you're with, that would be great. Yeah, my name's Patrick Alley. Um, I work with an NGO called Global Witness. Mm. Um, we look at areas where natural resource exploitation is linked to conflict and corruption. The first thing we ever worked on 23 or 4 years ago were, were forest issues and it's uh, and forest and land comprise about a third of the work we do. The other two thirds relate to oil and mining um, and resources from conflict zones. What we do is to investigate what's going on in given situations and try and expose that and, and change the law or, 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 or to advocate with policy makers. The, the, I wanted to make an intervention. I don't have a question, I'll be very honest. It's, it's just um, looking at this issue as I have globally for so many years, um, along with many, many other NGOs and, of course, indigenous peoples and local communities, we are not succeeding <coughs> in getting to where we need to be. I think that's evident. In fact, the situation is getting worse. It's what we call feral capitalism. We're kind of in, in an era of resource colonialism. It hasn't changed since the colonial power, since the conquistadores, since the British Empire, since whoever it is. It hasn't changed. Um, and countless case studies and uh, protests around protected areas, they may have, there may be local wins. We haven't got there. I'm not trying to depress everyone because I think, <laughs> I, I do have a, a suggestion, which is something we're trying to look at, which, uh, <laughs> which is basically changing the global economic system. Now, that sounds a bit ambitious, but um, I think genuinely it's the kind of direction that we have to go in. I, we cannot, as humanity, exploit every last resource mm -hmm. in every last place. Um, and we have to start denying companies and the governments they work with, often corruptly, the right to do that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it, we don't have enough time here to go into that, but I'm just sort of throwing this out there because we need to work more closely together. But a couple of things to put in there. One of the things you raised I think is really important is, you know, often the exploitation is done on the premise, oh, this is a, a development tool. We'll, we'll help these poor people get some wealth <laughs> and some income. And, of course, it doesn't. This yes. is not the way it works. But that's the way people think. I think Jim Kim, in, in his plenary the other day, got off very, very lightly, given what he's presided over in the reduction of safeguards by the World Bank, for example. Um, a, a sad but effective methodology we found is uh, one of our colleagues from years ago, a Cambodian activist, was murdered in 2012 for defending the forest. And we started on the basis of that producing an annual report on um, the killing of environmental defenders. And that's proved by accident, we didn't see it this way, as a really useful window that gets people who may not be interested in indigenous people or the environment or rights or resources, but they are interested when there's a story to be told. Mm -hmm. And when ordinary people are murdered for defending their land, that gets wide traction. Well, and I think so. that comes back perhaps to the concept that was being discussed by the panelists earlier around power and how do you bring power and leverage and uh, some of those, yeah. uh, some of the triggers for that power and leverage come from very unfortunate and obviously very costly yeah. uh, experiences. I know that you've probably got a lot more to offer. No, I, I was going to stop there other, okay. th other than to say we just need to collaborate better. Indeed. Um, here and the Magritte. So just down here. Actually, Donovan, can you pop your microphone over? Yeah. Um, I have two questions, but if I can ask them separately so the second one doesn't influence the first one, I guess. My first one was um, that you mentioned that poverty is a result of consequences and choices. Um, so I was wondering, what does justice look like for you, and how? what do you need to get there? I like that. Anybody specifically? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I can start with um, linkage of what, what Global Witness was saying um, about poverty is probably a consequence of what is called development. Uh, you know, I mean, the city of Cerro de Pasco, the example that I was showing you before, is one of the poorest places in Peru. Cajamarca is the second, is the second produce, gold producer region of America and it's the second poorest region of Peru. So it's, uh, there is a bunch of studies on this, on how the uh, extractivism or how the economy based on natural resources 
uh, is actually a trigger for poverty. And um, so, I mean, cases at a local or at a global scale, even if you take a, a very local example, which is the most, the poorest region of the United Kingdom, is Scotland, that is the region that produces oil. So it's, uh, it's basically uh, all over the world, with the exception of Norway, is always bringing this exception, but uh, that an economy based on natural resources is the trigger for poverty and not for development. And, well, the concept of justice, it's, it's kind of complicated. Sometimes you have to balance the concept of justice with the concept of guarantee a decent livelihood to the people who have been affected. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, justice uh, would have been that punish who has done the damages and avoid that it happen again, but at the same time so you have to deal with people that then have to live the entire life without their forest or without their water or so it's some sort of a balance sometimes that you have to do. Uh, Mandy or I would Victor? like to answer that uh, actually with my last image if you could put that up. To me my perception of justice is really having you know allowing my community members and future community members to practice their Cree way of life. So I just wanted to share this image because I think it is so powerful the baby boy in the middle is Jamun. His name is Jamun. He's one years old. In my culture, when you have a baby, your baby does not touch the earth for the first year of life. It's the mother's role to make sure that his feet never touch the ground. When he's one, uh, they build a teepee. You'll see in the back the blue curtain. And he walks out of that on a pass. And he walks around this tree. And I find it is so significant because just uh, Jamun is actually the newest grandchild in the family of the Segnash family. So the broadback will be his trap line when he grows up. To me, justice will be that Jamun can continue practicing the Cree way of life. Here he is in his ceremony being introduced as a new hunter, as the new steward of the land. To me, justice would really be having this little boy having the opportunity to live in the broadback, to grow up in the broadback, and to protect and be a steward of the broadback. For everything that we lost, the balance of having this this family be able to practice the Cree way of life untouched, to me, is justice enough. And I think that's a big compromise, but to me, that's justice. Thanks. Victor? Thank you, uh, Mandy. Uh, following on what uh, Patrick uh, mentioned, um, we are certain that um, the, the current situation of in, in, in indigenous territories and, and um, threatening uh, biodiversity conservation are uh, a lot of uh, economic pro and political processes using two main uh, tools, violence and corruption. And uh, for us, um, justice is uh, an active way to, 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 to overcome uh, those, uh, those tools. Right now, in my country, in the organizations and indigenous peoples I work with, we have uh, more than 50 people uh, prosecuted, criminalized by defending uh, their lands, their, their, their natural resources, and we are actively uh, defending them. But uh, on the other side, we are promoting uh, local uh, enterprises, community-based business. You are welcome to visit Guatemala. And despite all the dramatic things I've been talking about, you can visit. I, I, I have done with friends and, and uh, people from other organizations in the world to visit 10th uh, of uh, community-managed uh, protected areas and tourism destinations. And we are putting in place and trying to make more visible uh, how uh, other economic uh, models are possible, more just, more uh, fair economic, and we, n we need to, to, to push in, in, in both lines, denouncing, uh, struggling for rights, um, trying to, to put back uh, and, and to, to punish corruption processes that uh, have been taking place, and on the other side, uh, promoting uh, not only we are, uh, what we are against, too, but what is our proposal to society? We need a lot of <laughs> strength to, to do that, to make it more visible. That's the, where uh, media and all the, the, the people working to, to help us to make it more visible is, is quite valuable 
for us, justice is, is uh, pushing in, in that, uh, both directions. Great. I'm going to get you to hold on part two if I can, just so that we get a couple of other voices. Marguerite, can, and, and if we, yes. hopefully we'll get time, and if not, then everybody's, nobody's running off directly. I will make it brief. Yeah. My name is Marguerite Schreuders. I work for the Dutch Postcode Lottery, and we're uh, a funder of civil society, of organizations. Um, <coughs> over the last 25 years, we funded over 5 billion euros to organizations. So I want to reflect what you said. We saw as well that all the organizations working on protecting um, ecosystems, um, well, they are successful locally, but not on a massive scale. So we thought we need to bring skill to uh, to the solution. Mm -hmm. And we um, funded an, a project of 15 million last year, or we funded it in, in January, for Greenpeace um, HIVOS, it's a Dutch development aid organization, Witness, Article 19, several organizations, but also COICA, which is an umbrella organization of indigenous people in the Amazon. And this pro project is working together with COICA, working together with these indigenous people to protect the Amazon on a massive scale bringing technology to make sure that they can um, well show the proof of the, the, the destruction of their forest, of their lands. Um, also making sure that Greenpeace has enough funds to bring these companies, um, uh, well, to help them to account by naming and shaming, uh, making sure that the people in Europe or the people in the West know what, what, what is going on on a massive scale. And, um, we, we funded this project mainly because we want to show that this new way of, of combining human rights concept and the environmentalist uh, concept together will show that uh, we can protect the ecosystems, but we need other funders as well. Mm -hmm. So we gave the first 15 million, but I would especially like to, to urge the funders here in the room to check out this project. It's called All Eyes on the Amazon. It's of Greenpeace. And see if you can also join in and fund this new way of working together in this new coalition. There we go, an invitation coming out of, uh, out of today's session. And I would say my observation from the Great Bear Rainforest, which led to a landscape the size of Switzerland, like six and a half million hectares, with significant dual sort of pillars of conservation and human rights, the philanthropic community and their kind of substantive and long-term engagement in supporting both the capacity of the First Nations governments as well as uh, the conservation community was absolutely critical in that landmark agreement coming forward. So thanks for that. Uh, anybody on this side of the room? I'm just conscious that perhaps I'm having a left-handed bias here. We've got a couple of minutes left. Okay, we'll go to Ethan. And snappy, you know. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ian Han. I'm with the Forest Stewardship Council. And if, for those of you not familiar with the system, it's a um, market mechanism for certifying uh, responsible forest management. So uh, at FSC, we're a, a member-driven uh, organization. We're really a dialogue platform across all forest interests. And we've been working very hard for a number of years to um, uh, create empowerment and organizing mechanisms for indigenous peoples. And we now have a very active, permanent indigenous peoples committee within FSC that is, uh, that is that is completely run and, um, uh, and owned uh, by uh, indigenous representatives from all over the world. I just want to put that out there as a, um, as a solution and an ongoing dialogue trying to improve uh, this bridge between, uh, between global markets and the realities of indigenous peoples who, um, who want, <laughs> who want uh, their um, <coughs> cultures to live on generation after generation uh, while still having the opportunity to interact with that broader uh, global marketplace. So, so there's a lot wrapped up into that. There's um, the incorporation of free prior and informed consent. Uh, there's the issue of uh, intact forest landscapes, which we also call indigenous cultural landscapes uh, in recognition of that traditional knowledge. So that's really just an invitation to engage in a big, broad, global dialogue uh, about how, um, uh, how we can build this bridge across these fault lines. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, is it like a 30 second? Is it? Yeah, it's a question. Ex a Excellent. Um. Quickly, if we can grab. So I'm, I live in Toronto. 
And in Canada uh, recently, a uh, Truth and Reconciliation Report came out, which is challenging us, who are non-Indigenous, to think about reconciliation. And so one of the things that I heard is that there is, we can use what we consider to be like scientific data as a way to talk to people like me to understand. But I'm really curious about what, what do we need to change in how we understand? Like what would you want from us so that it's not only an Indigenous person's responsibility to start talking like people who look like me, but rather that we become, that there's just more equalness mm -hmm. happening, and I'm just curious about that. Mandy, can you give us a 20-second response to I that? I think for <laughs> me, what I would like is for Canadians across Canada to recognize that First Nations have taken on this role of being stewards to protect not only their territories for themselves or for their cultures, but for Canadians as a whole. You know, the Broadback is one of the largest carbon storage basins in Quebec. So I'm saving that forest not because I, only, I want that little boy to go and hunt there, but because I know that the carbon stored there is a benefit to Canada and the position that they want to be in. So I would like to see Canadians acknowledge and you know, understand that we, we carry a very big burden for ourselves as a nation, but we also do it on behalf of all of Canadians. You know, I'm, I'm as Canadian, I call myself First Nations, but I'm very, part, uh, very proud to be part of Canada. And I am a Quebecer. I'm very proud to be a Quebecer and to know that you know, Skoll was the idea of a Quebecer and he brought it to this international <laughs> forum. I just, I have to put that out Spoken there. Spoken like know? a true yeah. Quebecois, like claiming it. For me, it. it's just acknowledging and realizing that we do it on your behalf as well. Well, and I think that's a that's a great juncture actually to wrap this conversation. You that know her second question. You, you do want to know her second question? So uh, my second question was: New Zealand recently gave a legal human status to a river. It's the f only river in the world, and it's yeah, <laughs> it's it's wild. And it was the indigenous community there that fought for that. I'm curious what you think of that. What what your thoughts are, your reaction, and just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm glad, we, I'm glad we made space. Did you know that was the question? I am so amazed by that, and I want to know more about that, because that just, to me, makes perfect sense. You know, water is life. Water is the driving force of life. Without, without, without water, humans are nothing. So the fact that it's, it reached that level of recognition, recognition is, I'm kind of at a loss for words because I find that so interesting. I would love to know more about that. I find that is a good path to take. Mm -hmm. uh, 15 second uh, <laughs> Victor, and then... Yeah, just to say that the, the common ground among uh, indigenous peoples uh, across the world, which are, we are quite d diverse, uh, is that sense of uh, uh, humble uh, being, <coughs> considering the rest of, of elements in life uh, equals as humans. So I share what Mandy said. We really want to, to, to know more and to impulse these this kind of initiatives in, in our region. Patrick, I'm going to invite you to share your 15 minute second snippet afterwards. Um, but I'm, I'm going to wrap just because we are over time. It really is an important one, really important. It's, I, I'm, I'm sure it is, and I'm, I'm just going to hold this up. I shall be rebellious. The International Criminal Court has accepted that land grabbing is a crime against humanity. There you go. And I w that, I think, in terms of the closing, uh, it really feeds into conservation and indigenous rights. They are inextricably linked, right? Uh, this artificial uh, barrier that Western uh, uh, Western societies have posed and the separation of person from nature uh, is something that is a construct of our societies rather than indigenous cultures and I think that's one of the great things about cultures is that they're never static, they're dynamic and so hopefully as being part of this sort of fault line and this uh, the fault line being sort of really kind of a very significant cultural difference is that Western uh, uh, cultures will actually shift and change. So I really appreciated both of the, the questions that came from there. And then obviously indigenous rights are, you know, they're a fundamental human right and they're also uh, absolutely essential if we're going to a secure, durable 
uh, conservation. So I want to thank our three panelists. Please join me in giving them. Thank you for everybody for allowing us to run five minutes over, but given that we started five minutes late, it's kind of, we're right on time. Uh, everybody, if you could please fill out your little white forms. Uh, it was, uh, I think, a really uh, uh, a great move by the Skull Forum to actually add this content. Um, and so please, sort of giving feedback on just any value that you uh, found coming out of the conversation will be really valuable as they look to integrate and form their next agenda. Thanks a lot.